Thank you very much, sister. Um, if I knew, if I'd known that I was being introduced by a fellow Canadian, I would have brought some Tim Horton donuts. <laughs> because in Canada, Tim Horton donuts are the source of holiness. <laughs> because um, they've got a hole in the middle, and that makes you holy, and eventually if you eat enough of them, you begin to get a donut around here. It's a certain <laughs> incarnational thing there. So it's, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be here at Franciscan University uh, to take part in this, this conference uh, and particularly to, to look at the, the way in which we can grow in discipleship, the servants of our Lord Jesus. It is a question of catechesis, but I think it is really a matter uh, profoundly of the way we are formed in discipleship. And in uh, my own diocese, we, we call, in a sense, the catechetical office, the office for formation in discipleship. So what I'd like to do uh, this evening uh, is to look at three different dimensions of that. Uh, I always look at three different points. And once the best uh, teacher I had in the seminary was so organized, everything was three points. He was a very wonderful priest. We thought if he ever got made a bishop, his mitre would have three points <laughs> like that. So the, the three points that I, I want to, to make uh, this evening as uh, talking about this are, first of all, what is discipleship? How do we live as disciples of the Lord Jesus, deeply changed and transformed by our encounter with him? And through that, making present as instruments of God's grace the life of the Blessed Trinity here on earth. That's our mission. To, in our own communities, in our own, in our own heart, as we're temples of the Holy Spirit, and the Blessed Trinity dwells within us, and as everything we do in our parishes, our families, in the community in which we live, to have a world in which the relationships of love within the Blessed Trinity are made present here on earth, as our Lord Jesus made that present through his incarnation. So the first is to reflect a little bit upon that vision of discipleship. But the second point is sort of the downer. We kind of go down and look at the present world in which we live, and it's different for each one of us in different places. But I think in a, in a very real way, we are living in a kind of a secularized world which goes totally contrary to that vision of interdependent love which we find in the Blessed Trinity. That is the sea in which we swim. That is the air through which we fly. It is the environment in which we find ourselves and which comes into us constantly by a kind of toxic osmosis wherever we are. And so we're going against the grain, but that's what we're called to do as Christians. We're called to proclaim a vision of discipleship, which is rooted in the love of the Blessed Trinity and made present here on earth in a world in which that interdependent love is countered by a vision of independence, autonomy, ego, looking out for number one, what ultimately leads to hell, where the only song is, I did it my way. <laughs> and so that, that vision is countered by the world we live. But I then, the sec that's the second point, to look at some of the challenges we face. They may be different in the United States and Canada. I think, I sad to say, uh, that I think we're farther along the path of autonomism may well be in Canada. We have a very, uh, of a this sort of secular autonomy. Our government is really quite uh, something else uh, in terms of restricting the communities of faith and uh, Im imposing this kind of uh, secular cold vision. But I'd like to end off then with uh, some reflections on how we as disciples of the Lord may more fully make present in this world, in this world which is so rooted in individualism, how we may make present in this world, in our communities, in our parishes, our dioceses, our families, the vision of Christian discipleship, which is rooted in a vision of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that is what we're called to do, and that's what our Lord Jesus showed us. How do we do it? He came and showed us. What does it look like to have a Trinitarian love made present here on this earth? We look to the imitation of Christ. He showed us that's how it's done. I remember 
couple of years ago when I was about seven, uh, I won a bicycle. And I got on the bicycle, and my sister showed me how to ride the bicycle. So I was riding quite happily along, and she was running behind me. And then I realized she wasn't there anymore, and she forgot to tell me how to stop the bicycle. So I think that kind of demonstration is something that is very important, that if we want to know how do we do this living the Blessed Trinity in this ordinary world of ours, we look to the imitation of Christ. And that's where we find the way to do that, and that's how we find the meaning of Christian discipleship. And so let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That is our most common prayer. And we usually think it is a signal that we're going to start praying. It's also sometimes used in classes as a signal for the students to keep quiet. But it is actually in itself a profound prayer. And it reminds us of the meaning of discipleship. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But we're called to live in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can't get our little heads around the meaning of the Blessed Trinity. We only understand the gods we make. Success, power, we understand those things. The God who made us, we, we don't get our little hands and our minds can't get a grip on that. But what we do know, because the Lord Jesus came amongst us to show us, he gave us hints of what it is like. We know that God is all-powerful. We know that God is personal. We found that out in the Old Testament. But we could never know about the Blessed Trinity if Jesus had not pulled back the veil and let us see the glory that is there in the very inner life of God. And so he spoke of his Heavenly Father. He spoke of sending the Holy Spirit. He spoke of himself. And I'm reading, I'm going to be doing some talks later on in, uh, for a dear friend of mine, uh, Archbishop Miller, in uh, Vancouver for his priests about the Gospel of John. So I've been reading the Gospel of John again and again, and how often our Lord speaks of the one who sent me, the sending Father. I am the one who sent, sent by the Father. And he sent to us, and he sends the Holy Spirit to us. And it's in that kind of interlocking, mutual, interdependent love that we find the meaning of, of Christian discipleship. And Everything we do, our communities, our parishes, our families, need to make that kind of non-egocentric love present. And what does it look like physically? It's washing dirty feet. That's what Almighty God looks like. The love of the Blessed Trinity is shown through washing dirty feet. That's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. He not only gave us a sublime Holy Eucharist, but he washed the feet, the service of other people. In that we find a radiant vision of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the first point I'd, I'd like to make is that as we look to what we're called to be, to help form others through catechesis, through our own experience of teaching in different ways, to help form others in discipleship, we need to help others and help ourselves to grow in a sense of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That our life is not based upon the egocentric autonomy that is so common in our society. Not on independence, but on the interdependent generous love which we find made present in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the saints. That's our call, to do that. And then if we do that, we will be able to be effective instruments of God's grace in leading others to Christ and to be true disciples. In doing that, it all comes down to an encounter with the Lord, personal, because God is not the force, like the force be with you or something like that. God's a who, not a knit. This is one of the most basic grammatical points in life. We've got to know the difference between who and it, a person and a thing, a who and a what. God's not a what, God's a who. 
put it. I know, that'd be interesting. A nice book. Maybe the next encyclical from a Holy Father should be God's a who. I don't think that's, I don't think that's going to probably go very far. But we got to, you know, we got to love people the way the Blessed Trinity is loved and shown in Jesus. We got to love people and use things, not love things and use people. That's basic. We need to know the one we love. And so I just like to read as a sense of, of how we get a sense of that encounter with the Lord and the, the experience, the freshness of seeing who Jesus is. You can't beat the opening lines of the first letter of St. John. Now, I have a, a red Bible here because I believe that the Bible should be read. <laughs> and so, on that point, I can't help it. This is, I think, what your Constitution calls cruel and unusual punishment. But I'm a Canadian. I eat Tim Horton donuts. I, I don't know about that Constitution. So you're going to get punned to death here. I, I hate to say it. I only studied uh, the Scripture, but a lot of English literature. So, oh dear, it's bad. But anyway, here is this, this beautiful, like, and in, in, in the Greek, it's like breathless. It kind of bounces all over the place. But I'll try to kind of communicate that a bit. I, I, I'll ham it up. My mother said I could never be, a, a, you know, I, I ham things up so much that I... Oh, anyway, I won't say what my mother said. <laughs> There's some things your mother says that you should never repeat. But she said, if I was ever a spy, and, well, I'll say it anyway, I can't resist. She said, if I was ever a spy captured by the enemy, if they tied me up, I'd never give away the secrets because I can't talk without waving my hands around. So I'll ham it up a bit. But here's the first part of the first letter of John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we saw it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. It's interesting in Greek, our and your, it sounds the same. Himon, himon. It's kind of hard. So when people were, were producing this by writing it out, sometimes it, we're not sure what this should be. We're writing this that our joy may be complete, or we're writing this that your joy may be complete. And which of them is correct? Yes. You know, they both are. It's that, that kind of excitement which, which is to be ours. And it is in that that we find the heart of our discipleship, in that living with Christ and being with him. Not from the head up, but through experiencing his presence and being people through whom others experience the presence of Christ and thus are led, as we are led by the holy people around us, to live in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit by experiencing profoundly the one who shows us how to do that. And if we do that, then we will be forming people for discipleship. No matter what our programs are and our other, you know, nobody remembers what's taught. They remember who teaches. You know, whoever remembers the details? You remember the impact of the teacher. That's what they call Jesus, the teacher. And that's why they, you know, they respond that way. The one we have seen, we have taught, we have touched. And so that is, I think, the, the way in which we need to look at discipleship and help through our catechesis and everything else to, to let it be known. I recently, uh, well, this, was it this year? Yeah, earlier, I think. I went over to Rome. We had these ad limina visits. And um, looking at the different departments over in the Vatican, eventually you make, meet the Pope as well. And for the first time, I've been on three of them. One with Pope John Paul, one with Pope Benedict, and one with Pope Francis. And I went to meet, I went, the first time I'd ever been to the Department for the Causes of Saints, where they do the canonizations. Now, it's interesting where they put it. 
there's a big building in Rome where they have all these headquarters, you know. I think the bottom floor is uh, liturgy, uh, and then you get bishops. So they're higher, they're, they're kind of going up. And then you get the causes of saints. Apparently bishops are not as high as saints, but that's okay. <laughs> and at the very top of the building, you have the Department for Interpreting Canon Law, which <laughs> I've always thought was somehow not right. But when, when I went to the Department for Saints, they were saying, I don't know, this, what are they doing, this canonization? They said, why we do this is that the proclamation of the gospel and formation of people for discipleship is most powerfully shown by looking at the stories of the people who have lived it. That's why we canonize saints. I mean, God makes saints. The Pope doesn't make saints. God makes saints. The Pope just reveals it, makes sort of certifies it. But that's how we are formed in discipleship is by being saints. And I'll end off the presentation with that point, that that is the key method, if you want to say that, program, it's not a program, of course, the way we do what we're called to do is by living lives of practical holiness. There is no substitute, and it can be done day by day. And so what I'll do now is just look at some of the terrain in which we, we operate. Some of the world, and you're familiar with this, each one of us in different ways. I'd just like to highlight a few of the challenges, the kind of the static, the, the friction we face as we're trying to help people to grow in a life of discipleship. Well, I think one of the key things that we find in our society, and I think it's probably similar in Canada and the United States, is that we are in a, a secular environment in which the individual is exalted. And the goal in life is autonomy, independence. The most dreaded fear is to lose that, to be interdependent, to be dependent on another person. And we find that, and uh, I'm thinking of the experience we can all have at different times. You know people, and I'm hearing the, the just, I don't know uh, Dr. Willie, I've never met him, but hearing of a person who is struck down with a sickness and then becomes totally dependent. That is a time when a person, as has been said, is called to go deep in trust in the Lord. But I think we all like to be under the illusion that we're independent. Now, we can't keep up that illusion when we're children because children aren't allowed the luxury of being independent. And as you get older, you also are not that independent. You, it's amazing, you know, what happens as you get older. People don't speak as loudly as they used to. Um, you need these things to see what's going on. I don't know what it is. The eyes, there's something wrong with the paper. Like, the print is much smaller than I'm sure it used to be. You know, that's what happens. And the fabrics of clothing, they keep shrinking. It's, it's, there's something wrong with the clothing that's being made these days, and something must be done about it. But anyway, we, as we get older, we discover all kinds of muscles that we didn't know we had. Boy, I tell you, being 71 is a lot different from being 17. However, <laughs> the fact is that this desire for autonomy this exaltation of autonomy, it causes great evil. It causes great loneliness. And it's something that is radically opposed to a life of discipleship lived in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the imitation of Christ, whom we have seen with our eyes, we have touched with our hands, the one, the experience that, of encounter that we all experience in different ways. We are called to live in a life of relationship, and yet we live in a world of autonomy. We are called to be analog Christians in a digital world. The digital world, for example, just so that they don't have to get a hook, I've left my crozier at home, but it would work, to pull me off at 8.30, there's a nice digital thing here that says it's 8.02. And when it's 8.30, there's going to be, this will drop, and I will disappear. 
I think. So this is digital. Now, it's got a lot of credit to it. You know, you see 802, then 803, 804, 805, 806, dot, 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 bang, bang. Each one disconnected from the other. That's the world in which we live, in a digital world. And yet, if you see, like, at the back of this place, and on my little, I got to turn my little watch, not to a digital thing, but the screen, you know, where Mickey Mouse's small hand is here and his big hand is there. And in that thing, looking at that, it's a little past 8 o'clock, but it's not quite 8.05. We're kind of in relation, where we are is in relationship to where we were and where we're going. That is sen that's sensible, that's sane, that's humane. We are analog, by analogy. We operate with networks of meaning and structure and of love. Relationship. The web of love, the web of order in the universe is analogy, it is relationship. We are called to be analog Christians in a world that is tick, 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 you know, each one, each little individual atom. And that's, there's no future in that. There's no present in that either. You know, somebody once said to me, if you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. And it's true, we implode into ourselves. And that just is, there's no future there, but that is a very strong, part of the world in which we live. And so we must seek to celebrate relationships more and more of honorable love with one another and see to the relationships within the universe and not be caught up in this individualistic reality which is a kind of an exaltation of the will. My will. My. I. The smallest and most deadly letter of the alphabet. Egocentric. I think of a very egocentric king. And it's, it's a one. Have you ever seen the movie The King's Speech? It's a great movie. And I, I don't know how accurate it is historically to the two princes who were one became king and then the other in the 1930s. The one who was Edward the Seventh, uh, Edward the Eighth, and then uh, George the Sixth, but it speaks very uh, boldly to a real profound idea. The the glorious prince who was a star, um, who became Edward the Eighth, from birth he had been a star, and he could see his will as being central. Not order and pattern in the universe, the world around him, but he became, his will was central. This is sort of like the medieval philosophy called nominalism, which denied that there is order in the universe, that the things like truth, justice, or essence, or existence, all these things, that, that there is a real order out there. Instead, it is just what the individual wants. So, for example, we do not steal, and God says, do not, thou shalt not steal. The reason we don't steal is because God says don't do it. But if he said do it, we could steal. It's just the will, triumphant. And that's very dangerous. There is, well, the reason we don't steal is because stealing is, by the nature of things, wrong. That's why God says it's wrong. It's not wrong because God says it. He says it's wrong because it is. There's something out there that is hard and real, but you can't see it or photograph it. So the Edward VIII, what he was real to him was his, his own will. And even in that amazing farewell speech when he abdicated the throne to marry uh, Wallace Simpson, we often say, he said, I cannot fulfill my duty as king as I would wish to without the help and support of the woman I love, which is so romantic. And so egocentric, too, because what he actually said, if you listen to the recording, he said, I cannot fulfill my function as king as I would want to do so without the help and support of the woman I love. And I think, I wonder how much help and support. Anyway, we won't go into that. <laughs> You're married. Uh, I mean, it's very appropriate. His, not, his kingdom, he was King Edward, the V-I-I-I. -I -I. <laughs> but... His brother, his brother, however, was very shy and stumbled around and stuttered and it was not a star. But to him, kingship, honor, fidelity, 
These were real. They weren't like names, nomina. They weren't names. They were real. There was order and relationship in the universe. And so he became a very great man. And his brother, I fear, I think, did not. Why I use that example is because that kind of exaltation of the ego is deadly, and it is not just found in British princes and kings these days. It is found all around us. I know in my own country, and I, I don't know where you're at with euthanasia, we just had the Supreme Court a short time ago in Canada. Oh, the, our Supreme Court does all kinds of strange things. Um, and I don't get into that, but oh my gosh. Uh, they're suppressing Christian colleges and things like that. You can't have a little community college, a little Protestant one in British Columbia, that, among other things, asks the students and, and uh, um, teachers to promise that in that Christian community you're going to no lying, no stealing, and all that, and that marriage is between a man and a woman, you're going to be faithful husband and wife, you know? That's considered to be oppressive. And so it was argued up to the Supreme Court, which decided the Law Society of, Can of Ontario and, Quebec and uh, British Columbia, you can get a degree from that university, a very good degree, but you can't get a job because the Law Society says if you go to that university, it's oppressive by excluding people who don't believe that marriage between a man and a woman. So anyway, as argued up, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, the Law Society's right. So anyway, but we also have, uh, that was seven to two, but we had a, a nine to zero uh, judgment in favor of euthanasia, basically, a while ago. All based upon highly emotional arguments. And when people ask, why do they want this? Sometimes it's a fear of pain, and that's very understandable. It is very understandable, although palliative care can take care of that. I think when my, my sister was dying a few years ago from pancreatic cancer, there's a great pain in that. But I was very blessed. She was very greatly helped by the doctors who would give her help in dying. We, we call euthanasia in Canada medical assistance in dying, otherwise known as killing or lethal injection. But you can give medical assistance to people who are dying or who are, who are not dying. It helps, and so we should do that. Pain, can we should deal with it. You kill the pain, you don't kill the patient. And so that's one fear, fear of pain, and that's an understandable one. A fear of being a burden. You know, fear of being a burden. A burden to the children. I'm just too much of a burden to others. But we have to recognize that we are disciples of the Lord. We, we all depend on one another. We are depending on our other people and having them take care of us is not a bad thing. It's a noble and it's a beautiful reality which we all come to in different ways. We may just not realize it. Think of that picture, you know, of the poster... I think it was for boys sometimes. You see this sort of teenager with a, someone on, a young man on his back, and he says, he's not heavy, he's my brother. It all depends. So we need to help people to recognize, and you don't need fancy hospitals and expensive drugs and things for that, to recognize that we live in a relationship of love like the Blessed Trinity as disciples of Jesus. And so no one is a burden to somebody else. If we think they are, we've got a problem. And we need to be such people who don't think that way because that's bad. It's, it's no, there's no future in that. And also, sometimes, and this is especially true in Europe, I think, from what I've heard, that people say, well, look, I've, I've shot my wad. I've lived autonomously. I've flown all over the place. I've done this and that, the other thing. I've had a good life. But I can't do those things anymore. And so what's the point? I am now dependent I'm not independent, so give me the lethal injection. And that is also goes against who we are. And when people, even in our Catholic communities, even for the faithful Catholics, they begin to think that way, that we need to reach out and help form people in discipleship so they'll realize that our life is full and it does not depend upon my ability to do when I'm older what I used to do when I was a teenager. We all break down. And there's, uh, Shakespeare has a wonderful uh, statement about that. You know, how the seven ages of man, we end up with sans teeth, sans hair, sans everything, you know. But there we are.
So this kind of, we are in a world, as we're trying to live a life of Trinitarian discipleship, seen visibly through Jesus our Lord, whom we encounter constantly in word and sacrament, as we're trying to proclaim and form in that discipleship, we're doing so in a world which celebrates the untrammeled ego and considers a lack of independence to be unlivable. And so we're going against the grain of society. And so no wonder we have a song, All the Lonely People. Where do they come? Where do they all come from? And we're doing this all in a world which celebrates interconnectivity. You know, we're all friends on Facebook or something, you know? They're all relating to one another, like that. Uh, somehow it doesn't seem to be enough. This kind of uh, digital, uh, well, the digital again, the digital relationships. And we can help, you can email back and forth, you can have some connections, but it's just not the real thing, it's just not enough. All the lonely people staring into their little computer screens, which suck time away, like that. Where did time go to? Time that could be used in living in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by loving. And yet we're all abstract. I remember I was at a meeting on Catholic education, which we have a different system in, in Ontario anyway, but there was a whole bunch of us Catholic educators. At a break, we all pulled out our little, our little uh, strawberries or blackberries or whatever they were. <laughs> and, uh, and we were all either in the apple orchard or the berry patch, we were, we were all present to the people who are absent and absent to the people who are present. Now that's insane. It just doesn't make sense. You know, that's the opposite, but that's, that's our world. And it's kind of nominalism gone mad. The same thing, of course, with conscience. That conscience means what I think is right. If you sort of think it over, study it a bit, whatever you want to do, that's your conscience. That is such a false view of conscience. It's not the right way. And sometimes, you know, Thomas More is shown as a model of conscience. Indeed, he is. But his conscience was not that I want to do it this way. It was because he studied and reflected upon the teaching of the church. He saw what was right, and he did it because it was right. So this is the world of autonomy. So here's some suggestions, some kind of uh, your friendly neighborhood cardinal, a few little ideas here. Okay, point number one. Take this down. No, point number one. Um, a little hopeful sign. And that is, in all this world, which I'm painting as a kind of a desert of autonomy, uh, there are, the one thing that everybody has bought into, including the most secular people in the world, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Everyone accepts that. They don't maybe know it's Christian. They do. So if you see someone who's a victim, you reach out to them at the side of the road. Now that's a good thing. We can build on that. You know, give me a little thread, then a rope, then we can build. You know, when you start across, you, you want to build a bridge? So this enormous bridge over here. I don't know whether they shot a thread across the river and then brought a rope and then a beam and then a bridge. But sort of you kind of have to do that. So we got a little bit here to work with. The fact that everybody believes in helping victims. Now, it can be misused, manipulated. If you declare, I am a victim, the door is open, gold sours down, you know. So it can be false victimhood can be used to manipulate. And I won't get into examples of that, but it can happen. But it is true, it's a noble thought, a noble thought. And so I think we should remember that. And that's why, as we think about how we can help people to, to grow in discipleship, uh, what I think we should do is think about faith, hope, and love. Faith is the beginning. We see the hand of God. This leads us to hope, and it bears fruit in love. But if we're to form people in discipleship, what we need to do is begin with love, helping the victim at the side of the road, which we do all the time, and help bring people into that, that they may be filled with hope, and then ask, why are we doing this? 
Why are we doing this? Remember the story of someone in a jungle, this sister was helping the most difficult people in a terrible situation of sickness, and some millionaire went by and said, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. And the sister said, I wouldn't either. It's love that makes that. And why does a person love? Because of faith. So that's what we should do. Take the thread we have that even the most secular people see that. This is what we see in Frederick Ozenam. He was a young university student, and he was uh, with a group of his students, studying, fellow students, studying the faith, conferences in honor of St. Vincent de Paul. And one of the sisters who was working with the poor in Paris said, get out there and start helping the people. That's why the St. Vincent de Paul Society does it that way. And they're still called conferences, but it's helping people in practice. The faith and the hope, but you, you, in practice you start with the love. In theologically, you start with the faith. And next, I think another principle it might be good to think of is what do we do, how we approach this. It is care for the gathered, reach out to the scattered. This is kind of the pastoral plan of my diocese. Care for the gathered, those who are here. You know, put on the... I just came in, flew in this morning. When, uh, when the, we had the awful moment when the little oxygen drops down, Put it on your first, first before you help the other so that you don't die of oxygen deprivation before you can help the other. So let's care for the gathered. The people are already coming to church so that we may reach out to the scattered, to the people who are caught up in the lonely desert of secularism and of autonomy, triumphant, destructive autonomy. I think that's a good principle to use. What we do in my diocese, we break it down into vibrant parishes, vocations, carefully thought out of all vocations, practically caring for the needy, and evangelizing the culture by doing all of that. It's very, very important to reach out to the scattered and care for the gathered. Our communities that do that need to be communities of real Trinitarian love, where people are attractive to come to people who are really showing, see how these Christians love one another, draws people in, draws the scattered in, if they see the gathered are living that way. I think Mark Twain said, I don't think I want to go to heaven because none of my friends will be there. Um, I see his point. We don't want people living the Christian faith with grim determination. I remember a priest at the seminary I taught at once, he said, the faith that is sad or mad and not glad is bad. And there's a lot of truth to that. So we got to have this welcoming communities where you see a joy that's not happiness or optimism, which for which we often have no... Emotionally, we don't often have happiness. Something goes up and down. Optimism, have you seen the papers? If you look, optimism? Oh, good grief. But hope we have, and hope brings us joy because we see all the grim things around, but in the hand of the provident God, Jesus Christ is Lord, and therefore, whatever the things... One of my favorite hymns is, Oh, God beyond all praising. And whatever things happen, you know, I'll try, we'll triumph through our sorrows and rise to bless you still. But there are going to be plenty of sorrows to triumph through. Uh, so that's, an, I think, an important thing. I once asked a priest, actually from around here, uh, Father Ronald Knott, who came up to speak to my priest, and he had some good advice. This is practical advice. So I, I never, never forgot it. Well, I don't. I'm telling you about it. He said, what do you want to do if you want a parish to be vibrant and people, disciples, join together? What you do is put your money in the music. Good point. Harmony. Trinitarian <laughs> harmony. Put your money in the music, your time in the homily, and stand at the door of the church. Encounter people. Don't write them letters. Meet them. Not that, you know, push the send button. No. Go and see people face to face. Do you know why? We, when we're typing things on the internet, we say horrible things. We would never say to someone we saw face to face. No, we've got to see people face to face. Our communities have to be like that. That's like when I, I've been, I've been a bishop 21 years now. Oh, good grief. 21 years. And I've had different vocation directors. I always say, look, don't pump out brochures. People, not paper. You know, this is the way. So stand at the door of the church and meet the people. That's kind of, kind of crucial. And that's what we see in, uh, and, you know, be, we want preaching to be not sort of theoretical, but deep down from the heart and the mind. 
head, heart, and hands. I always think this is, um, this is my old bishopy. Uh, I guess I can, 21 years, I can have some old tricks of the trade. Head, heart, and hands. Whenever someone comes to my office, as they do every half hour, I sometimes dive under the desk in a fetal position. Oh, no. No, just kidding, just kidding. But when people come with all kinds of good things and bad things, and especially when they come with a good thing, I say, is it head? Is it thought out? Is it heart? Does it have a little love in it? Is it hands? Is it something practical? So if we're going to be forming people into discipleship, always think of that. Is this theologically? Is it intellectually? God put our heads in so prominent a place in our bodies, he must want us to use them. We've got to think it through. And then, is it got warmth in it, love? You know, we keep all pumping out documents. All the bishops are former professors. We can't help it. We just, documents come flooding out. And nobody reads them. You know, why would they? Whereas, the, the, you know, the children of darkness are telling stories, which are convincing Canadian Supreme Court justices to allow lethal injection. I mean, Jesus told stories. We should do that. Remember the Greek thing, ethos, pathos, logos? It's from Aristotle. Build a bridge of trust, touch the heart with a story, and then tell them the truth. Communicate the truth through a story when you build a bridge, bridge of trust. I think that's the way to do it. And if we're going to communicate our faith, we should do no less than that. I mean, let's imitate our Lord Jesus in that. He talked about mustard seeds. You know, he didn't talk about the eschatological significance of the Christ event. Good Lord. Oh, oh, that would be horrible. That would be, oh no. Anyway, so these are some kind of, you know, little nitty-gritty things I just suggest that we might want to, to do. Um, but the most important thing, and I think those saint makers in the saint department of the Vatican were right. The most important thing is sanctity. It's nothing is more important than the witness, communicating our faith, the witness of saints. Not just the few that get canonized, but the witness of saints who have encountered our Lord Jesus and who are trying to live it with all their sinfulness day by day. And if you ever hear that Christianity, or anything to do with Christianity, is an ideal up there somewhere, floating, kind of over there, maybe made of crystal with balloons keeping it up. <laughs> Nobody can read, you know, you can't actually live Christianity. Oh, well, what happens if we've got to dumb it down? No. <laughs> Saints live Christian faith every day. It's very common. The great challenges of our Christian faith are the pathway to sanctity. And it happens all the time. So the idea that there's a certain model of Christianity somewhere out there, uh, we all bow to it, but no one actually can be expected to live it. That is simply wrong. We are called every day to live. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life, day by day, day by day, to see thee more clearly, to love thee more dearly, to follow thee more nearly, day by day. I mean, it's done all the time. It's not just the saints we get out of the, you know, the canonizations. So there is nothing more important in our life of catechesis and of Christian discipleship then day by day in a repentant spirit, recognizing that the gospel is not beyond our reach. Why would the Lord God toy with us? Toy with us? Here's the gospel. I remember I, I do this sometimes with the little kitty, Patrick and Mickey, two little kittens my sister has. When I've been known in my weaker moments to dangle a little thread right in front of them and they're jumping up, you know. But I don't think God treats us that way with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to live it, but, you know, live it daily, practically. Um, I have five minutes and 26 seconds left, so before this drops, I'm gone down below. I don't know what's below here. So I don't think I'll read you the whole of this thing, but I, I recommend it to you. It's a thing by um, John Henry Newman, and I'll, I'll read a bit of it. 
I'm not talking about sanctity. I'm not talking about kind of you know, leaping through fire or you know, doing all that. Some people do that, you know, martyrs and so on. Some people are called to die for Christ. But we're all called to live for Christ in washing dirty feet, things like that. That's holiness. That's what it looks like. And we're all called to it. We're not told it's something that a few people off somewhere else do. Every single Christian is called to be a saint, and every single Christian can become a saint by God's grace, the grace of God. And I should put on a tweed jacket. I have my, uh, you know, my watered wool here, but um, here's John Henry Newman. It is a saying of holy men that if we wish to be perfect, we have nothing more to do than to perform the ordinary duties of the day well. A short road to perfection, short, not because easy, but because pertinent and intelligible. I think this is a very sensible way in which we should proceed. What is meant by perfection? It means doing things faithfully, the way they should be done. He then is perfect, who does the work of the day perfectly. This is John Henry Newman, it's also the little flower, you know. And you don't have to go beyond that to seek for holiness. You don't have to go out of the round of the day. I insist on this because it will simplify our views and fix our exertions on a definite aim. If you ask me what you are to do in order to be holy, I say first, do not lie in bed beyond the due time of rising. Give your first thoughts to God, make a good visit to the Blessed Sacrament, say the Angelus devoutly, eat and drink to God's glory, say the rosary well, be recollected, keep out bad thoughts, make your evening meditation, examine yourself daily, go to bed in good time, and you are already perfect. That's what we're called to do. It's sort of the ordinary way in which we're supposed to live our lives. And so this is the way we are to live. It always has been. It always will be. This is living in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the imitation of our Lord Jesus Christ in the little things of life. And that touches the heart. And then when we speak the words of the gospel, there will be willing ears to hear them. And when we recognize, each one of us, that we are so very frail, we nonetheless say, Lord Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And help me grow day by day to sanctity. And that, I think, is what it's all about. So I'll end off with these wonderful, familiar words of, of St. Paul, which sort of tells us what we're supposed to do in our life. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And having been found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to glory, the glory of God the Father. Amen.